Welcome everyone to the UNESCO World Press Freedom Day Lecture. My name is Camille Naked, and I will be your MC for the night. So a few housekeeping rules. In the case of fire, assemble outside the building, just follow David. <laughs> Bathrooms are located on this level here, just to your right. And for the speakers that will be here, um, David has advised that you come to the podium for the purposes of the camera. Uh, the Pacific Media Center, along with UNESCO, are committed to bringing the issues of freedom of the press and the infringing practices with which many journalists around the world are currently faced. Henry Steele Comadre said, censorship always defeats its own purpose, for it creates, in the end, the kind of society that is incapable of exercising real discretion. Some of our speakers here today have, experiences these, have experienced these dangers of journalism, yet have maintained their commitment to ensuring that other journalists and those who aspire to be journalists are given the freedom to cover and report the news unharmed and free from terror. Now, before I introduce Professor David Roby, I would like to acknowledge one person who has worked really hard to put this together, and she's going to be really grumpy with me, but Del Absede, I'd like to acknowledge her. <laughs> it is my honor to introduce Professor David Roby, Director of the Pacific Media Center, Editor of the Pacific Journalism Review, author of several books, the Pacific Media Center has proven itself through David's research and scholarship 
to be a place that provides a type of journalism that speaks without fear or fable. So it is my pleasure to introduce David. Thank you, uh, Camille, for that amazing introduction. It's much longer than what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, but Tenakoto, uh, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Qatar. Um, warm greetings from the uh, Pacific uh, Media Centre uh, to our chief guests, uh, Professor Mark Pearson, all our UNESCO colleagues and supporters of World Press Freedom and Free Speech. And a particular welcome to Elizabeth Rose, who's the Secretary General of uh, UNESCO, who's come up uh, especially for this event, and also Susan Isaacs. And uh, she's Senior Advisor to the uh, Communications Program for UNESCO. And it's thanks to them that we've been able to uh, have this event uh, tonight. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, and welcome uh, Tim McBride, who's the Deputy Chair of UNESCO Communications Subcommission, Nigel Horrocks, and uh, Dr. Cheryl um, uh, and Parliament was with, with uh, them uh, tonight. And a special welcome to uh, Octavianus uh, Mota. Uh, he's a uh, pa West Papuan journalist uh, who's in New Zealand this week and uh, he's here with us tonight. He used to be the uh, Papuan uh, editor, uh, regional editor for uh, Compass, uh, ma the major daily newspaper in uh, Indonesia. And all their other our uh, friends from the industry, uh, media industry, are here, here with us tonight. Just before we started uh, this evening, um, we, you know, that might, some of you might notice that we were running a film. And the reason for that is because uh, um, uh, Mark, uh, uh, students from Griffith University are, are watching uh, tonight on live streaming and, and many others as well. So we thought we'd better put something on. Uh, to entertain them um, while we were, we were sort of um, uh, in, in mingling out there and, uh, and uh, before we got, really got started. But just a word for those who saw something of that film, uh, it was called uh, World Press, uh, well it's um, Media Freedom in the Pacific and it was made by the staff and students of the University of South Pacific for the International Federation of Journalists, uh, but particularly for the UNESCO World Press uh, Freedom Day and interviewed editors right around the, the region. Um, it's, it's my privilege to welcome all tonight because uh, we, you know, as many of you know, the Pacific Media Centre has been very strongly supportive of media freedom in the region uh, for a very long time. Uh, and one of the things that's concerned us is that the, uh, although the UNESCO World Press Freedom Day is celebrated all over the globe, May the 3rd uh, every year, uh, it's taken much more seriously uh, in countries that have an endangered news media than here in a country such as New Zealand, where we tend to take it uh, for, for granted. Um, so in the South Pacific, um, Media Freedom Day is taken very, very seriously each year and observed all around the region right now in Nonyara in the Solomon Islands. Uh, events are happening, but the events are happening all, all around the region as well. Um, and, um, it, you know, last year we had a panel uh, presentation around media freedom and that sort of opened up the way uh, for this event tonight and uh, thank you very much UNESCO, thank you very much to the School of Communication Studies uh, and uh, thank you um, um, Professor Mark Pearson for coming over for this, thank you. Uh, thank you David. Now I'd now like to introduce the Dean of the Faculty of Design and Creative Technologies, Desna Jury. She's just making her way over the you. That was a very um, elegant start, I'm sure. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, this uh, event, uh, which is an inaugural event, so we hope that we have these again in the future, is at the heart of the interests of uh, the Communication Studies Department at this university. So I'm absolutely delighted to have such a great turnout and to have you all here. Uh, many of you will know that uh, we have just um, opened the most brilliant uh, media facilities in this building for our journalism students and uh, the Communication Studies Department and the school is one of the pearls in the crown of the university and with these state-of-the-art facilities we feel really proud. I am sorry that we aren't in that lecture theatre tonight um, in the new building because, as you know, we've had a power cut, but I've just read on my text that um, we're guaranteed that the power is going to be on for the rest of the evening, so that's cool. Anyway, uh, I also want to just acknowledge um, a couple of new staff that have joined us, and I think that make um, 
give the, the weight of the experience that we have in, uh, in, the, in the university. So you're going to meet um, shortly Professor Judy McGregor, who has um, a great history um, in this area. And we have a new um, curriculum leader in, um, in Dr. Veritza Rupa, who's also with us this evening. So I'm really um, proud and pleased to welcome them. I just um, want to finish by um, acknowledging Mark. Um, obviously, um, we're going to hear more um, about him and from him, but he has spent uh, a lot of time with us this week. He's been working um, in the Pacific Media Centre, looking at what its future will be and helping us um, define that and analyse that. And um, it's been great to have his um, wealth of experience and expertise um, um, brought to the thinking around that. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Desna. I'd now like to invite Tim McBride. As um, David pointed out, Tim is a Deputy Chair of Communication Subcommission of the New Zealand National, New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO. He's also Auckland human rights lawyer, author, and legal commentator. And he really wants me to say this part. Tafili's wife is a senior lecturer at AUT in Pacifica Early Childhood Education. I did it for you, Tim. <laughs> That's a payback, you realise. It's our wedding anniversary today, and I woke up and gave my wife a card to discover she'd put it all on Facebook before I woke up. <laughs> and, and her many hundreds of friends, if you go to it, are aware of what I thought was a rather intimate personal day. <laughs> all right, let's get underway. Tenakotu, Tenakotu, Tenakotu Katoa. UNESCO is the only UN agency with a specific mandate to defend freedom of expression and press freedom. And it's one of the organisation's overarching goals. And UNESCO's constitution, adopted in November 1945, November 1945, keep that in mind, states that the organisation will collaborate in the work of advancing mutual knowledge and understanding of all peoples through all means of communication and promote the free flow of ideas by word and image. Now, I find those words both remarkable, those uplifting words, remarkable in both their vision and in their relevance to us gathered here today. Today, as you've heard, is World Press Freedom Day. And the date of May the 3rd was chosen to celebrate the historic declaration which was adopted at a UNESCO meeting in Namibia on the 3rd of May, 1991. And that declaration states, among other things, that press freedom is only possible in a free, independent and pluralistic media environment. That, says the Declaration, is a precondition, a precondition for journalists to be safe to practice their craft. Now, in a keynote address to a World Media Freedom Day conference in Brisbane in 2009, UNESCO's current Director General, Irina Bokova, emphasised its role, and I quote, as a champion of freedom of expression and the right to know. These, she said, were indispensable for the attainment of all human rights and fundamental for strengthening democracy. That is a direct quote from the Director General's words. Now that statement serves to remind us of a number of things. One, coming from my background as a human rights lawyer, that the human right to freedom of expression has two key components. One is the right to seek relevant information. If you cannot get access to relevant information, how can you possibly have an informed view? You can have an uninformed view, or ill-informed view, I should say, but you really need to get access. And the second part is obviously the right to impart information and ideas of any kind through any form of media. 
Now, her statement also serves to highlight another aspect, that freedom of expression is very much a right from which other rights may flow. Without it, other fundamental human rights, such as your right of freedom of association, to associate with other people, like-minded people, and your right to assemble peacefully, in other words, what we call in New Zealand, your right to protest. If you don't have the right to freedom of expression, how can those rights be exercised effectively? Now this year, UNESCO's focus on World Media Freedom Day is on ensuring the physical and psychological safety of journalists on all media platforms and addressing the high impunity level of crimes against press freedom. Now what does that mean? Well, I interpret it as meaning that most people and organisations, state or private, who commit crimes against journalists, and let's not beat about the bush here, this involves murder, assault, kidnapping, disappearances, do not get caught, and if they do get caught, they seldom suffer any meaningful form of punishment. Now, according to UNESCO's Director General, I'm being very careful, I'm using official material wherever possible, over 600 journalists have been killed, and I interpret that as murdered, in the past 10 years. Now work that out in weeks, folks. That's approximately one journalist a week gets murdered for being a journalist. Last year alone, according to the Director General, 121 journalists were murdered. And that's that's almost double the annual figures for 2010 and 2011. All these journalists had one thing in common. They were all exercising what many in our society, and I express my personal view, what many in our society appear to take for granted, even trivialise. I sound like a grumpy old man, don't I? But you can sense I feel rather strongly. Um, the fundamental right to freedom of expression. These journalists were murdered for simply doing their job. And that is why on this day, May the 3rd, we honour their immense courage and we commemorate their tragic sacrifice on World Press Freedom Day. Now, despite its recognition in an international human rights law, and in our Bill of Rights Act of 1990, how well is the value of freedom of expression actually recognised? How widely is it recognised is it, and nurtured and protected in our society? Yes, it's there in the law, but in terms of the reality of our day-to-day -day lives. And if you were asked, what rationale would you give for asserting its importance? in our rapidly evolving society. I've always been attracted to the idea that it's essential, among other things, for the discovery of truth, for the exposure of falsehood, to paraphrase rather crudely the great English poet John Milton's noble sentiment. Now Milton, as I understand it, was confident that in a free and open encounter, truth would prevail. I suspect some of you have rather less confidence these days. With governments around the world placing increasing controls on the media and ever greater ownership and increasingly control of major segments of the media in ever fewer hands. Think Murdoch, think Fox News, think Aussie mining barons and baronesses. And in recent years in New Zealand, there have been numerous instances of high-profile people, for example, celebrities, causing offence by some of their public utterances. While some of those views, I admit, struck a chord with me, others I found distasteful, unpleasant, offensive, call it what you like. However, 
When I was tempted to join in a chorus of condemnation, privately at least, I reminded myself just in time, just in time, of what freedom of expression is really all about. As George Orwell once said, freedom is the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. And more recently, Noam Chomsky reminded us that if we don't believe in freedom of expression for the people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. You don't have to agree with them. You can have a very strong disagreement with them. As Voltaire said, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Now, freedom of expression purists, and there may be a few in this audience, would say that there should be no limitations on its exercise. That's not the case in the US, despite its cherished First Amendment, nor is it the case here. As one of our leading media lawyers said to me recently, believing in the value of freedom of expression is the easy part. The more challenging inquiry is determining just what the justifiable limitations on its exercise should be. Now, new limitations on the exercise of freedom of expression keep popping up. They keep appearing. Most recently, the proposed laws on cyberbullying. How many of you regard this as a serious issue, sufficiently serious to require a serious legal response? I suspect that for many in this audience, it's the breathtaking potential of the new media that's the subject of their keenest interests. And it's therefore most appropriate that we have a distinguished speaker to speak on the implications of this subject to us tonight. And I note that Professor Pearson is intending to make some reference to the responsibilities of people using these new media platforms. And I kept in mind what columnist Simon Cunliffe wrote very recently in the Sunday Star Times, where he said, with new technology comes responsibility. Like it or not, he said, the new media should have boundaries. Uh, something Professor Pearson may wish to debate with us at some stage. What are those boundaries? To conclude, very briefly, just a very brief word about this event is also the inaugural National Commission of UNESCO New Zealand Freedom of Expression Lecture. Our National Commission, and we're, we have our Secretary General with us tonight, uh, for UNESCO has made freedom of expression the highest priority for its communications program. It enthusiastically endorsed a recommendation from its subcommission on communications, not to be confused with a certain communications bureau that has been much in the news in, in recent months, that there be an annual lecture on the value of freedom of expression. And in this regard, I wish to acknowledge, and he's here tonight, it's hiding at the back somewhere, the persuasive advocacy of our chairperson until recently uh, leading journalist and author Paul Smith. Our inaugural lecture was to have been held in Christchurch. Then, as we all know, there were a series of devastating earthquakes. The lecture had to be postponed not once but twice. But thanks to Professor Roby and his hard-working team, New Zealand's National Commission for UNESCO and the Pacific Media Centre, working together in partnership, are finally, finally able to stage the inaugural Freedom of Expression Lecture on World Press Freedom Day. How timely and appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and happy anniversary from all of us to you. Um, I would now like to introduce Professor Judy McGregor. Judy is Head of School of Social Sciences and Public Policy at AUT. She's a former editor of a number of newspapers and is a journalism academic. Professor McGregor will say a few words and will also introduce the main speaker, Professor Mark Pearson. She will also facilitate the question and answer session following Professor uh, Pearson's speech. Thank you, Camille. Kia tato, no mai, haere mai. I'm going to be mercifully brief and spring to introducing Mark. 
journalism and journalism education in the Asia-Pacific region has been enriched and in many ways defined by the work of Mark Pearson. If you were to walk into any journalism uh, environment or newsroom in Australia, you will see dog-eared copies of his Bible, The Journalist's Guide to Media Law, now in its fourth edition. A distinguished journalist himself, Mark is the Australian correspondent for Reporters Without Borders, and he was the special reports editor of The Australian. He's published in the Wall Street Journal, the Far Eastern Economic Review, and numbers of New Zealand newspapers. He has been a critic of those who complain about media excess and triviality, without also celebrating quality journalism. And he's constantly warned us of the incursion of spin doctoring and of infotainment that masquerades as journalism. He also has taken a leadership role in urging newspaper editors and teachers to pay more attention to the importance of media literacy amongst young people. And most importantly, as a commentator and an ed educator, he's been at the forefront of writing and thinking about the rise of citizen journalism in the social media and its democratising impact. But Professor Pearson brings another essential e quality to journalism education in Australasia, and it's one that Desna alluded to. He has been and is remarkably generous in his support of emerging journalism educators, those interested in media law, and those who report in the Pacific. He really does live up to the notion of academic collegiality. After a long and heroic stint at Bond University, Mark took up a position as Professor of Journalism and Social Media at Griffith University in Queensland. I can't think of a better choice to deliver the UNESCO World Press Freedom Day lecture on press freedom, social media and the citizen. Professor Pearson, the floor is yours, and we'll look forward to roasting you afterwards. Well, thank you, Judy and Tim uh, and my UNESCO colleagues. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge the Tangata Whenua of Tamaki Makora and to thank my hosts here at AUT's Pacific Media Centre and the School of Communication Studies for your hospitality this week. The Pacific region can lay claim to several press freedom warriors over recent decades. It would be a mistake to try to name these individuals in a forum like this because you inevitably leave someone off the list and they're usually sitting in the very room where you're giving your address. A press freedom warrior is someone who's made a substantial sacrifice in the name of free expression and a free media. For some, that sacrifice has taken the form of physical injury or danger, perhaps even death, as we heard from Tim. According to the Committee to Pre Protect Journalists, more than 100 journalists were actually identifiably murdered in the course of their work internationally last year. And more than 20 have been killed already in 2013. Some were relatively close to home in the Asia Pacific region with at least 72 Philippine journalists killed over the past decade. Throughout the Pacific Islands, many others have suffered physical violence or have been imprisoned in recent years because of what they have reported. I also include in my definition of a press freedom warrior those who have suffered in other ways because of their commitment to truth-seeking and truth-telling. Some have been the victims of lawsuits and have had to pay damages to those who have set out to gag them. Others have forsaken lucrative positions in, in government or public relations so they can continue as fourth estate watchdogs in preference to becoming political or corporate lapdogs. We're honoured to be in the company of press freedom warriors in the room today or watching via webcast. And I ask you to join with me in a round of applause to salute them on World Press Freedom Day.
I'm not a press freedom warrior. I've made none of those sacrifices. I prefer to describe myself as a press freedom warrior. And for speakers of English as a second language, that's W-O-R-R-I-E-R. -R I worry. Because much of my work has centred upon my public expressions of worry about a continuing array of regulatory, technological, economic, corporate and ethical threats to free expression and to free media. I'll try to address some of these here tonight and I look forward to some robust discussion afterwards. Before we go too far, however, we need to position the concept of free expression and its offspring, press freedom, in the modern world. And Tim's done a little bit of that, uh, that for us already. The free expression of certain facts and views has always been a dangerous practice in most societies. There have been countless millions put to death for their attempted expression of their so-called dissident religious or political views throughout history. Many more have been imprisoned, tortured or punished in other ways for such expression. A classical free expression martyr was Socrates, who in 399 BC was forced to drink hemlock poison by the government of the day because he refused to recant his philosophical questioning of the official deities of the time. It was the invention of the printing press and the burgeoning of the publishing industry over the 16th and 17th centuries in the form of news books and pamphleteers that first prompted repressive laws and then the movement for press freedom. It's interesting that these individuals were the forerunners of the citizen journalists and bloggers we know today, often highly opinionated and quick to publish speculation and rumour. But the pamphleteers took umbrage at government attempts at imposing a licensing system for printers from the mid-16th century. Political philosopher and poet John Milton very publicly took aim at this in 1644 with his missive Areopagitica, a speech to the Parliament appealing for the freedom of the presses. He went on to utter the famous free speech, quote, Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience, above all liberties. Milton was an early free press warrior because he boldly inscribed his name on the title page of his unlicensed work. In defiance of that very law he was criticising. So with this series of events, the notion of free expression spawned its offspring, press freedom, which we celebrate today. Of course, the definitive example of that development was the enactment of the First Amendment to the US Constitution as part of its Bill of Rights in 1791. And the relevant 14 words would fit very comfortably within a modern-day 140-character tweet. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The US Supreme Court has applied a broad interpretation of those words to an array of writing and publishing scenarios. It's been held to cover the gamut of traditional and online expression by ordinary citizens, journalists and bloggers, particularly if they're addressing a matter of genuine public concern. But even in the US, the First Amendment cannot guard against government erosion of media freedoms. And that nation languishes at number 32 behind Ghana and Suriname on the World, uh, Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index for 2013. In fact, nowhere in the world has there ever been unshackled free speech or a free media. We operate on an international and historical continuum of press freedom or censorship from whichever perspective you wish to view it. It is only over the past half century that the notion of free expression and a free media has gained traction on a broader scale internationally. And the key international document is clearly the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in 1948 enshrined free expression at Article 19. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, 
This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media regardless of frontiers. At face value, this statement seems to give all the world's citizens a right to free expression. But it was only ever meant to be a declaration of a lofty goal and has many limitations. Stronger protections came internationally in 1966 when the UN adopted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, prompting a series of binding treaties. The Covenant introduces a right to free expression for the world's citizens, again at Article 19. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing or in print, in the form of art or through any other media of his choice. That was 1966, of course. It sounds like it was almost written for bloggers and citizen journalists. However, the right is limited because the covenant imposes special duties for the respect of the rights and reputations of others and for the protection of national security, public order, public health or morals. Add to this the fact that many countries have not ratified the covenant and you're left without much real protection at this level, I'm afraid. Complaints about individual countries' breaches can be brought to the Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights, but the processes can take several years and are often not resolved, as their annual reports seem to demonstrate. A positive of the UN right, though, was that it fed through into the regional conventions and in turn into the laws of their nations. Rights charters exist in Africa, the Americas and Europe, and free expression or a free press is guaranteed by the constitutions of many countries internationally. In the Pacific region, we have no such rights charter, a regional rights charter, although many nations, including Papua New Guinea and New Zealand, have either constitutional or legislative rights protections for free expression. Pacific Media Centre director David Roby has crit critiqued the ease with which the governments in Fiji and Tonga have changed such provisions when this has suited their political ends. Theorists have attempted to group different functions of the press within government systems. Most notable was Frederick Siebert's Four Theories of the Press, 1963, which categorised press systems into authoritarian, libertarian, Soviet communist or social responsibility. Others have criticised the Siebert approach for its simplicity and outdatedness, with Dennis McQuayle adding two further categories the development model and the democratic participant model. Some countries justify their stricter regulation of the press and limitations of press freedom on religious, cultural or economic grounds. There's been an ongoing debate about the lack of press freedom in the Asia-Pacific region. Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei and Fiji have state licensing systems in place for their newspapers. Malaysia also has its Internal Security Act, restricting publications on such topics as the position of rulers, the position of Malays and natives, the status of Malay as the national language and citizenship. As our former student, Reginald Dutt, I say our former student because both Professor Roby and I have, have taught this uh, scholar, as Reginald Dutt noted in 2010, Singaporeans have been led to believe that their model of news media suits the interests of their wider society and that the media's role is to support the government in its quest to promote harmony, solidarity, tolerance and prosperity rather than to question the existing social, political and economic structures. He showed how the Fijian regime had modelled its own approach to media regulation on the Singapore structure in Fiji's Media Industry de Development Decree. As a press freedom wa warrior, uh, my concerns are not limited to Singapore and Fiji. My major worry is the ever-increasing government regulation of media and social media everywhere. My observation has been that governments are quick to enact laws to control emerging social and technological situations but are loath to wind them back when they prove unjust or the reasons for their existence have long gone. 
<coughs> examples of such laws that are an anachronism in the modern era and still exist in many Pacific nations are laws of sedition, criminal libel, and I might say Australia still has criminal libel laws, and blasphemy. Add to these the spate of anti-terror laws introduced since 9-11 and you start to get a potential armoury of tools available to governments and their security agencies for surveillance or intimidation of the media. Even laws endowing journalists with special privileges are worrying because they often require a definition of who or what constitutes a journalist. Shield laws are a good example. At their best, they offer journalists sanctuary when being pressed to reveal their confidential sources in court. However, the downside is that a shield law for journalists requires a court to deem who is or is not a journalist, a process which, when taken to its extreme, can constitute a licensing system. It is even more problematic now that citizen journalists and bloggers are covering stories of public importance when they might not meet a government's definition of journalist. As a press freedom warrior, I'm also concerned by the technological intrusions into free expression and a free media. As an avid blogger and social media user, I can attest to the utility and reach of these new media. And we've seen via the Twitter revolutions in North Africa how social media can be a useful tool for dissident mobilisation in autocratic regimes. Web 2 communication has further empowered ordinary citizens who can now publish at their whim in the form of blogs, tweets, podcasts, Facebook postings and Instagram and Flickr images. Citizen journalists can crowdsource funding for important stories and not-for-profits can operate their own news platforms to compete with the legacy media. Yet at the same time, the internet has given audiences and advertisers so many new choices that the financial model of those traditional media is under chronic stress. The important fourth estate journalism, once funded by the so-called rivers of gold in the form of classified advertising in newspapers, has all but lost its funding base. Investigative reporting calling governments to account does not come cheaply. It involves weeks of groundwork by senior journalists, photojournalists and video journalists and funding of their salaries, travel expenses and equipment. It typically requires further investment in the time of expert editors and production staff. But the former multinational newspaper companies that once funded this investigative enterprise have been shedding staff, rationalising operations and slashing budgets. There's a ripple effect through the Pacific of the impact of such measures in major Australian, New Zealand and North American newsrooms. It's not just their domestic investigative reportage that suffers, but also their international reportage and foreign correspondence. This means the policies of governments in Pacific Island nations are exposed to less international scrutiny and that breaking news is more likely to be covered on the cheap by so-called parachute journalists who fly in and out to report in a superficial way. An unfortunate byproduct of this, of the financial demise of big media, is that they no longer have the deep pockets to fund the lobbying for media freedom that they've conducted over recent decades. Tighter budgets means less funding for submissions to government opposing media threats, appeals to higher courts on points of law and free press pr principle and a greater tendency to settle out of court to reduce court costs and potential exposure to higher damages. Bloggers and citizen journalists are left stranded without the resources to defend legal threats unless they can garner the support of a union or an international NGO. I might say some of these, including RSF, do have some insurance schemes. Another downside to the technological revolution is the level of surveillance of the journalistic enterprise available to governments and their agencies. Anti-terror laws introduced internationally and modelled on the US Patriot Act typically give intelligence agencies unprecedented powers to monitor the communications of all citizens. There's also an inordinate level of surveillance, logging and tracking technologies in use in the private sector, 
often held in computer clouds or multinational corporate servers in jurisdictions subject to search and seizure powers of foreign governments. This has disturbing implications for journalists' protection of their confidential sources, typically government or corporate whistleblowers who risk their reputations, jobs and even lives if they reveal information to reporters. I blogged recently asking whether the Watergate investigation could happen in this modern surveillance era because it was premised upon the absolute confidentiality of the White House source known as Deep Throat, who recently revealed himself as FBI executive Mark Felt. Well, if that was happening today rather than 40 years ago, the Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward and their secret source would have to contend with geolocational tracking of their phones and vehicles, toll point capture of their motorway entries and exits, easily accessible phone, email and social media records, CCTV in private and public places, and facial recognition in other people's images, perhaps posted to Facebook. The use of new technologies like drones, which have been used for military purposes, but my colleague David Goldman, uh, who writes for Oxford University Press in Media Law, has been examining their use in the media context. Drones and Google Glass. Hands up those in the room who've, who've seen Google Glass or its preview trailer. Only two or three, so the rest of you really need to have a look at that. It could be a monumental flop within a year, or this time next year, everyone in this room might be wearing a little piece of perspex on their eye, which is interactive, and can film what's happening here, it can allow communication via social media, and have geolocational facility, all of those things you get on your smartphone can be on a little piece of perspex there. And that's the idea of Google Glass. Google it and you'll see. Well, these drones and Google Glass will equip journalists with significant news gathering capabilities, but will at the same time risk further compromising the ident identities of their confidential sources. All this might sound terribly pessimistic, but despite my press freedom warrior status, I'm actually an inherent optimist although probably not quite as hopeful as the stated theme for today's UNESCO World Press Freedom Day, safe to speak, securing freedom of expression for all in all media. While we might aim to secure the ideal of freedom of expression in all media, it can only ever be an aspiration, of course. There's always a looming threat of censorship in even the most liberal societies. Perhaps it's time for a new approach to media ethics and regulation, and certainly to the education of young journalists. While I don't approve of the Malaysian, Singaporean and Fijian application of the development model I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure the libertarian model, strongly identified with the British and US media in the 20th century, is the only workable approach. Winston Churchill once described democracy as the least worst option. Is the libertarian model of, free, of press freedom also the least worst option? Or can we have press freedom within some other system of regulation, certainly within some other ethical context, implying some different ethical framework for truth-seeking and truth-telling? There's no doubt that press freedom is entrenched in the libertarian traditions of Western democracies and it's sometimes seen as another feature of colonialism that has been imposed upon societies, including those here in the Pacific, as a compulsory add-on to democracy. But that implies that truth-seeking and truth-telling can only be part of Western culture and that is clearly not the case. My very first academic article in 1987 took up the issue of information sharing in Indigenous Australian societies and questioned whether the techniques of modern journalism were well suited to interviewing and reporting upon Indigenous issues. Information exchange in Australian Indigenous societies had cultural implications related to the status of the parties involved, 
and the period of time allowed for the communication process. Veteran New Zealand journalism educator Murray Masterton had already noted codes of practice within Samoan society, where in some situations it was even a taboo to ask a question of an individual with a higher social status. Countering that, Samoa also had the tradition of the revered Tusitala, or storyteller, the name conferred on the great author Robert Louis Stevenson when he lived there for the four years before his death in 1894. It was an esteemed position in society. Papuan tribal societies also valued communication highly and can in some ways be seen as the consummate news reporters through their use of the garamut and the smaller kundu drum to send clear and simple messages across hilltops and through dense jungle. However, journalists in Papua New Guinea face challenges through their own cultural practices of wantok and payback, which imply both an obligation to members of their own social network and retribution against others for wrongs done to their kin. It renders the roles of whistleblower and investigative reporter even more isolating and socially reprehensible despite a clear constitutional guarantee of media freedom in that nation's constitution. When used to describe approaches of governments to media regulation, the libertarian model has been most commonly associated with the private ownership of newspapers and their active watchdog role as the fourth estate in a Western democratic society. Even liberal democratic societies have adopted a social responsibility approach to the regulation of broadcast media, given the public or collective interest in control of a scarce resource, given the traditionally limited number of radio and television frequencies available for allocation. Recent inquiries into media regulation in the UK, Leveson and Australia, Finkelstein, and New Zealand, the Law Commission recommendations, have proposed extending that social responsibility model to print and new media regulation, despite the fact that the scarcity of resource argument is diminishing. Rather than taking a libertarian approach and reducing the and actually reducing the government uh, regulation of the broadcasters because the frequency scarcity and media concentration arguments are diminishing, the reform bodies have recommended mechanisms to bring newspaper companies within the ambit of stronger government control. Their motivation for doing so stems from public angst and subsequent political pressure over a litany of unethical breaches of citizens' privacy over several years, culminating in the News of the World scandal in the UK with an undoubted ripple effect here in the former colonies. I'm at great risk of oversimplifying this important issue because many other factors are at play, including some less serious ethical breaches by the media in both Australia and New Zealand. These have been evidence of mainstream media owners using their powerful interests for political and commercial expediency. And the important public policy challenge facing regulators in an era of multi-platform convergence and citizen-generated content. So press systems and ethical frameworks are on the agenda in all societies and we're challenged to accommodate free expression and its close relative free, uh, press freedom within new technological and cultural contexts. If we're to stick with a libertarian model and continue with light touch media regulation by governments, we clearly need more meaningful ethical guidelines than the ones that do not always seem to work in mainstream journalism. David Roby's been among those exploring how a peace journalism model could be applied to the reporting of conflict in the South Pacific and to the education of journalists in this region. It requires a deeper understanding of the context and causes of a conflict, a commitment to ensuring the views of all sides are reported, comments from those condemning any violence, reducing emphasis on blame or ethnicity, and offering suggestions for solutions. He's also drawn some Pacific cultural elements into his proposed model. This kind of approach has great merit, and I'm currently examining ways it might be extended to a new framework for reporting more generally 
by implementing some of the key principles of the world's great religions in a secular context. When you look closely at Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism and Buddhism, you find common moral and ethical principles that we might reasonably expect journalists to follow in their work, including all those attributes of peace journalism identified by Roby. The Dalai Lama's recent book, Beyond Religion, explores how core ethical values can offer a sound moral framework for modern society in a secular way, while accommodating diverse religious views and cultural traditions. I believe this sits well with a modern trend to apply basic principles of mindfulness and compassion to a range of human endeavours. It seems to have been um, uh, you know, quite the trend in, in the US and, and Britain in recent years. Zen this, mindfulness that. I'll be exploring applying this to journalism in a conference paper I'll be presenting in Dublin next month where I call it Mindful Journalism. It suggests we should educate journalists, serious bloggers and citizen journalists to adopt a mindful approach to their news and commentary which requires a reflection upon the implications of their truth-seeking and truth-telling as a routine part of the process. They'd be prompted to pause and think carefully about the consequences of their reportage and commentary for the stakeholders involved, including their audiences. Truth-seeking and truth-telling would still be the primary goal, but only after gauging the social good that might come from doing so. The recent inquiries into poor journalism ethics have demonstrated that journalism within the libertarian model appears to have lost its moral compass, and we need to recapture this. Even today, young people choose journalism as a career with a view to make a difference in society. Like teaching and nursing, the choice of the occupation of truth-seeking and truth-telling in our societies has an element of a mission or a calling about it. And I mean this in a secular rather than a religious way, of course. A deep sense of social responsibility to expose wrongdoing and injustice and to facilitate the exchange of ideas on important social issues. All societies need their tusitalas, their storytellers, in whatever form they may take. With the advent of citizen journalism and the widespread use of social media, we can no longer claim this as the exclusive preserve of journalism and journalists. Social media and blogging seem to have spawned an era of the new super pamphleteer, the ordinary citizen with the power to disseminate news and commentary internationally in an instant. We are quickly losing the distinction between journalists and other communicators, accelerated by the fact that their traditional employers are forcing journalists into the blogosphere as the old model suffers under the strain. Journalists' codes of ethics have long been associated with the traditional mainstream media and have usually been documented and administered by unions or professional associations. But we now have many ordinary citizens producing the reportage and commentary that was once the preserve of those who called themselves journalists. We need new ethical codes of practice that are inclusive of these new serious bloggers and citizen journalists. The printing press spawned free expression's offspring, the right to, a free, uh, to press freedom as pamphleteers fought censorship by governments in the ensuing centuries. Events are unfolding much more quickly now. It would be an historic irony and a monumental shame if press freedom met its demise through the sheer pace of irresponsible truth-seeking and truth-telling today. Our challenge is to educate our fellow citizens on the mindful use of this fragile freedom before their elected representatives take further steps to erode it. Thank you. Mark, will you, you stay there because we're streaming, is that right? Sure. Yes. So, yeah. Question time? Question time. Right, I'm going to open it up immediately to the floor.
No, sorry, guys. No, there's no microphone here, sir. So. Otherwise, I'll just repeat the question. Yes, sir, repeat the question, yeah. Come out. Go, Sorry. Wayne, and Come we'll on. repeat the question. I'll repeat the question, Wayne. I'll, I'll, I'll give my... Um, that, that's not putting that away. Wayne, just say the question, and I'll repeat it to my advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the Boston bombing. Boston bombings? And how a candidate for who the bombers might have been was identified through citizen journalism combined with crowdsourcing. Um, um, those ways of identifying the person responsible got it all wrong. Um, and if you follow the trajectory of that story, what you've really got is anti-journalism. Uh, even, even the most basic elements of putting together a journalistic story were not followed there. So clearly, social media has the capacity to undermine the principles and practices of journalism as well as advance them. So my question to you is, which way is social media going? Is it more likely at the moment to undermine the principles of journalism and the case that I've described, or is it more likely to advance them? Well, thank you very much. It was a, a, an excellent question around the Boston bombings and the fact that some suspects were identified wrongly in the early stages of the investigation, so some people still live today with the uh, stigma of, of having been photographed and identified via so-called citizen journalism or at least via social media capture and dissemination of their images. And so their reputations were very badly damaged and obviously caused huge um, uh, you know, torment to them uh, as individuals. Um, Actually, through that whole episode, my greater regret was that a major US newspaper picked, picked that up and uh, published it. So I, I think that was more of a, a concern than the social media rumour mongering and the spread within social media about it. And the reason for that is that I think if the traditional media has any hope of surviving into this new area, it has to distinguish itself through its verification, its, its checking mechanisms, its attribution mechanisms, and just holding back slightly on publication while it does all of those traditional journalism, uh, makes those traditional journalistic efforts. And then people, through education and, and social media literacy, will turn to traditional media as the authority source. They'll see those sorts of rumours, they'll realise rumours circulate in social media, and then they'll turn to the authoritative source for confirmation. This time, if they turn to that particular title, uh, there could have been more than one, I'm aware of at least one major title, then they got the wrong thing confirmed. And to my mind, that's a, a death signal for traditional journalism if they, if they um, join the rabble with, its, with their non-journalistic methods. Um, there's much more we could debate about that, but thanks for the question. Philip? Uh, yes, I'd like to support everything my colleague has said. Um, I would like to ask you, though, you, there's this whole question that you've raised about what is a journalist. Once upon a time in another life, when I was editor of the North Queensland Register, a paper famous for its coverage of cows and sugar cane, um, we had the then equivalent of bloggers. We had stringers who sent in stories and photos of Jim Carnes from Mount Isa and other places, but we subbed their copy, we cropped their photographs. My question to you is, how on earth are we to prevent news organisations running foolishness like this if we don't impose controls and take care of things. How do we live in an age when the BBC on its world news page says, oh look, are you there? Tell us what's happening, send us your pictures without any apparent sense of making sure that it's right or wrong. Mm. How do we, in an age like this, where there are bloggers 
look at somebody, say in the UK, like the Dido Forks blog, which looks like, you know, a, a, an innocent political blog with a gentleman who writes a piece <coughs> about strong ties to the Tory party. How on earth do you expect to control this in an age when for what we used to call the bosses when we belonged to unions, look at bloggers and citizen journalists and simply see it as a way of getting rid of the professionals and the trained journalists and replacing them with gossip and photographs and exciting facts. Well, thanks, Philip. There are uh, so many issues there in that, uh, that question. As they say on the Australian program q and I'll, I'll take that as a comment. Uh, yeah. But uh, breaking through the comments, a lot of your question was to do with user-generated content and the um, speed and willingness uh, with which mainstream news organisations just simply showcase unchecked, unverified, uh, user-generated content and even go out um, and plonk it uh, into, their, into their mainstream material when they haven't even got the permission of people to use their Facebook images or whatever. So they just sort of um, cut and... It's a cut and paste or it's a, it's a showcase of user-generated material. Well, frankly, I think this is a mistake taking it that far uh, by the mainstream news organisations because anyone can have that level of content um, using an interface on their device uh, that allows them to showcase, say, a, um, a hashtag on a, on a Twitter feed. They can just then view it that way rather than go to the mainstream media. So um, I guess it comes down to journalistic practices and shaping those practices. What they're trying to do, of course, is this big thing of be part of the conversation or at least... In, on some occasions, host the conversation within their site. But I think they're facing a losing battle, and part of our fallout of traditional media will be those who are actually giving something quite different and new and verified and credible uh, will be the ones who survive. In the interest of gender equity, is, is there a female question that I can go to? I can't right. think, I can't think of someone go more qualified... It. Uh, duty to uh, no, to, to, to on put, a little bit of gender equity. That's right. Uh, mm. Sorry, the, the, the yeah. I mean, again, it's perhaps a comment, but it might be something that you have great insights on. But I was um, reading about WikiLeaks and putting the Julian Assange character aside. What I realised is that WikiLeaks was really destroyed by three or four major corporations that were able to undermine the impact by closing economic sources, by closing down servers. So I mean, to some degree, I feel it's an illusion that all this chatter is democratic. But when it really, really, when the push comes to shove, increasingly the consolidation of ownership, particularly of the kind of underbelly, I'm not even talking about, you know, traditional media or not. It's kind of the, it's something like Google, it was, or maybe, I mean, I may be talking about MasterCard, Apple. I mean, it's just a handful of corporations that were able to kind of, in a sense, stop WikiLeaks. And, the, and its example, I suppose, is whistleblowing. But I just wonder that from a media law perspective, do you knew any more about that? Well, while I wrote a recent book um, on like taking an international look at media law, including some analysis of WikiLeaks, um, I certainly don't claim to be a, a global expert in this area. You raise a lot of issues, and, and the question is related to WikiLeaks and effectively the, um, the multinational um, uh, boycotting of uh, donations to WikiLeaks, which really crippled the organisation in, in the wake of the release of the trenches of documents. So um, it, it, it starved the organisation of funding. But WikiLeaks is such an enormous uh, story, it's... It, um, it's dangerous for me to go too far into uh, a public discussion about that because undoubtedly there'll be uh, real uh, there'll be people who are polarised um, one side or the other in this debate. What I found uh, regrettable about the WikiLeaks experiment was the fact that we we do have uh, the suspected source of all of that material um, in detention and facing trial in the United States. So. Um, to my mind, as a journalistic experiment, while it was successful um, in exposing all sorts of material, which 
you know, as a truth seeker and a truth teller, you know, it's better to see much of that out there, particularly what it said about international relations and government relationships and atrocities here and there and, um, and major governments um, in action on certain issues. While all that was a very positive outcome, the price that's been paid is that um, a, a, a suspected whistleblower uh, was very seriously exposed uh, through that process. And uh, I wonder whether, um, coming back to Wayne's point with the, uh, the, I mean, Assange has been celebrated, given journalism awards and all sorts of things, but the question is still out there as to whether he is actually a journalist. Uh, it seems sometimes he's willing to uh, take that title and other times not. But if he's some kind of uber journalist, then that basic source protection, I think, has been an issue uh, because one wonders whether the proper measures have been taken to protect the confidentiality of that off-the-record uh, individual. But thank you. Good question. Okay. Mm. Yes. Yes, go. Hi, Mike. Um, I'm Jeff from the Pacific Media Centre. I'd just like to take you to the Pacific. Uh, you mentioned about you know, PG as well, culture, the education, you know, uh, you mentioned about the, the laws and you know, the constitution there. And it's, it's quite interesting because when you look at the Pacific, they are still there. They haven't moved. You know, you know what I mean? They haven't moved. When we talk about press freedom, it's like the name of the club. You know? It's like the social club where the Chinese belong to that club. So what about those on the other side? They haven't joined that. So in terms of education, what, what needs to be done so they can move on from, you know, from where they are now? Well, it's a very good question. It's relating to um, whether much of what I've said this evening has any real application in, in small island nations uh, that may be at um, a different stage of development and perhaps with a slightly different government system. And what about journalists working in those environments? And um, some of those, uh, I was trying to make the point at the beginning that these are what I, I see as genuine uh, press freedom warriors because they've been jailed many times, they've been sued by their governments, they've, um, they've put their whole livelihood on the line by running small privately owned newspapers. Sometimes they've had to leave their own country and come somewhere like New Zealand or Australia to the expatriate publishers back into their country. So you have all of these sorts of other issues at play. What can be done to um, better educate uh, these journalists about their role, uh, well, I actually think that the culture of free expression is actually rife within Pacific Island journalists. Uh, I think the greater problem is the literacy about uh, truth seeking and truth telling in the communities in which they live. Um, so uh, building that level of knowledge and respect both within their fellow citizens but particularly within their government leaders. Now, they may choose to have some slightly different system of government from British, American, Western democracy, when, when you've got to realise, of course, that the UK and America actually have different systems of government, so it's not like it's part of a, um, you know, a Western colonial package. Uh, so I was trying to get across the point that there are mechanisms for truth-telling within all cultures, and really it's a matter of identifying within the particular cultures how best to tell the truth. Sometimes it might take slightly longer to come out. Sometimes it might be through certain channels that it needs to come out because of cultural traditions. But if culture is standing in the... If, if a cultural barrier is uh, protecting some wrongdoing, some crime, some corruption, um, then it's the wrong culture to be preserving. Uh, that element of the culture is the wrong part to be preserving and we need to find a way to tell the truth within that culture and protect the truth tellers. Thank you. Hi Mike. Um, in the Philippines there is a law that has been passed just lately about uh, prohibiting some uh, the people, the citizens, to publish on the internet criticizing the government, we call it the e martial law. Uh, what is it? Uh, at the moment, it has been uh, 
ordered by the court to stop implementation until when and how, we don't know. Now, uh, my question is, what is the implication of this to the Pacific Island nations, just in case it is implemented? Hmm. So Dell's um, question relates to a recent law in the Philippines, which is on hold for the moment under a court order. Yeah, yeah. under a court order. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. For example, if uh, somebody uh, uh, put on the internet criticizing the government, they call it libel, uh, and if you click uh, share or like, you will also be penalized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the Dell's question is about a, a law in the Philippines, which is basically uh, banning or proposing the ban of internet criticism of the government. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, I would suggest that this is um, nothing new. Uh, and what I mean by that, it's centuries old. It's, um, it's just symptomatic of, of a government trying to gag free expression and criticism uh, through self-interest. Now, you were saying that it's on hold through some court order. Well, yeah. that's, that's very good. Um, hopefully there is something about the Philippine Constitution that protects free expression uh, that, that the courts are drawing upon to uh, hold yes, back this, is, this, but, this law. Uh, you know very well that uh, there is a rampant corruption there. So mm, mm. Well, we um, governments, yeah, governments um, uh, with powers to legislate uh, combined with corruption uh, um, also cause these problems. But the thing about the internet is that it defies borders. So um, the message needs to be sent to these governments very, very clearly that those criticisms, if they are justified, will still come out and they will still be there on the internet. And they'll be coming from beyond uh, the Philippine borders and they'll be also be coming from uh, you know, relatively powerful other governments and NGOs like Reporters Without Borders and Transparency International and Article 19 and Committee to Protect Journalists and all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Electronic Frontiers, uh, all of these different organisations uh, will bring the power of international uh, condemnation upon them. And um, this will be aired over the internet uh, for the reading and viewing of their own citizens. And probably much more so than whatever the original little criticism was on Facebook that somebody liked. Hopefully, hopefully it won't take effect. Okay. Paul? Thank you very much for your speech. Thank you. Well, I may not have expressed it well enough, um, but I thank you for your uh, comments and, and it's worth kind of trying to clarify uh, what I was saying there. Uh, the first point is that uh, I'm not proposing peace journalism. Uh, this is something that has been developed by other academics and David Roby's had a, had a go at trying to adapt that model to, to the Pacific. But I don't think peace journalism anyway is meant to be an apology for an existing government. Uh, the idea of peace journalism, I think, when, when considered carefully, is what quality uh, foreign correspondents have always done. Uh, it's basically um, going in, trying to get a, a mosaic of viewpoints, um, giving a voice to those who are trying to solve the conflict rather than just highlighting the warmongering um, you know, uh, comments of those, the two sides that are speaking against each other and quoting directly the you know, often racist or culturally inappropriate things they might be saying about the other. You know? So peace journalism isn't sort of this beautiful sunshine thing where we all um, smoke peace pipes and, uh, and, and, and publish sunshine news. So, so I agree with you thoroughly uh, about that. 
my suggestion for mindful journalism is also something that I think that a good journalist would already do. And it, and it harks back to that early work that I did with Indigenous Australian reporting, which is really looking at the means of cultural and information exchange within a community and trying to work within that, but still meeting the deadlines and whatever back home. But you might need to wait a while. You might need to um, you know, get to know your contacts, get to understand uh, their way of dealing with the information and the fact that a foot in the door and a microphone in the face is not culturally appropriate in most parts of the world, including our societies. You know? So uh, it's, it's basically, you know, as academics, we're idealists, you know, we, we're trying to find some new way both of um, understanding issues but also of getting the whites of our eyes of whites of the eyes of our students and trying to find something that appeals to them that gives a different perspective. So so mindful journalism is just simply pausing, <coughs> thinking about the interests of others and what the implications of this story will be, but getting the truth out there if there's some public good that's coming from that. And it would mean that the news of the world reporting would not have happened because a mindful reflection upon what they are actually doing uh, through those, you know, uh, the surveillance and so on they were doing. Um, no pardon? What if there's no public good to be had and it's all visceral on both sides? What would happen? Well, what mindful well, there's a fundamental public good in the exchange of ideas. So. Um, and, and in the free flow of information in society. So the question there is, what if there is no public good that can come from something? Um, well, in, I guess if there's no public good at all that can come from something and it's going to damage society badly, then we would reconsider it very carefully before we published it. Hmm. Okay, the, the, now we've got a, a crop. I'm going to go for another, <laughs> another gender equity question, the lady on the to the left, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Mark. Anna, student at the Pacific Media Centre. I just want to ask you um, how relevant do you think press freedom really is to the large groups of people who are normally ignored and marginalised by the press? You know, namely the poor and the working class, um, workers who go on strike. Most of the time, their stories are ignored and they're covered very superficially. And you know, in, in this country, you have newspapers who, who describe Maori people as feral. Um, I was really shocked when I first came here to see that this is allowed in print and there's been protests against racism by the newspapers outside the NZ Herald. So, I mean, would you really expect, you know, Western press freedom to be very relevant to people who are being demonised by the media or likened to wild animals? Well, it's, I'd call that a loaded question, Anna. Um, and, uh, and, and Anna's question is, um, what relevance does press freedom have to... Uh, people who are marginalised in society and f for whom the traditional media has often been very critical and, um, and added to that marginalising. So um, my answer might have been different 10 years ago. Uh, today I really think there is such um, an accessibility uh, through technology um, for formerly marginalised people to have various voices, um, either through their own publications, that of the organisations they belong to, um, that of um, people who adopt their, their cause or work with them in some way, um, to get that counter message out there like never before. So in the former era of a heavily concentrated media, um, I really take your point. There was, um, it was very difficult to get many marginalised and minority voices um, into the mainstream media. Of course, that is still a problem, although in journalism courses, I think we've really ramped up the education um, around minorities. I, I'd say some of the negative comments you're talking about uh, have often come from populist columnists and uh, on-air commentators who seem to trade in playing to prejudices in society. And bloggers. Uh, yeah, and, and well, of course, there are bloggers that do these sorts of things as well. But um, uh, I really have, this is where the optimism kicks in, uh, that now there are so many other opportunities for voices. <laughs> and, and um, you know, people are also fluctuating to the media that 
agrees with them more, you know, agrees with their viewpoints more. And uh, in some ways that's polarising the community and people are only reading and viewing material that supports their worldview. But in other ways it's also getting, uh, allowing a, a critical uh, mass of the voice of the marginalised to be heard uh, either through themselves or through other organisations. Kia ora, John Miller. Thank you, Professor, for your speech. What I'm just wanting to raise here is what recognition is being given to the influence of big money in, in the media area. I've got two instances here. The, um, the American multi-millionaire hotel and casino magnate Sheldon Adelson, who bankrolls uh, Israel Hayom uh, uh, in Israel uh, and is um, uh, choking uh, the more liberal newspapers, um, Mari and Haaretz, because he Just remember, I have to repeat the question, oh, so okay. if you can keep it relatively okay, succinct. I'll, yep. I'll say, um, mm. Adelson is bankrolling a newspaper in Israel that, that he gives out free, and the more left-wing newspapers are being choked because of this. Mm. The other, um, and of course, uh, Adelson's newspaper supports the Likud party very strongly, the other instance in your own backyard is, uh, is the attempts of uh, mining magnate uh, Gene Reinhardt to use the millions of the uh, Hancock Empire to, to uh, uh, muscle in on Fairfax and turn Channel 10 into Fox News. Hmm. So th okay. You have those influences which I see as a as a threat to press freedom. Hmm. Well, um, the question is related to big money and, and, and media and, uh, and whether... Um, you know, basically the voices of mainstream media uh, can be bought by private commercial mega million dollar interests and really what can be done about this and uh, I'm afraid the sad fact is that um, the traditional media have all, always been um, owned by major uh, players. Uh, I'd suggest probably a, a bigger challenge for us at the moment is um, moving in the new online platforms to uh, major corporate multinational often US ownership of these new media platforms which is affected at the time of the demise of empires like Murdoch's um, which is really just replacing one multinational entity with another and at least with Murdoch, where it was often uh, very much in a self-interest or a commercial interest, but that organisation was often um, challenging all sorts of and lobbying for press freedom, you know, uh, and and that was their catch cry, admittedly through self-interest at times. But you wonder whether Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, the, the, these sorts of platforms um, have that ethos. There's certainly an American ethos there, which is a, you know, a First Amendment kind of uh, ethos, but then some of these companies also go over uh, to China to try to sell their platforms there as well. So you wonder what compromises are being made there. So I don't think there's an easy answer to big money and media, whether it's new or old. But what is encouraging at the moment is this little space that we've, we've just discussed there, and that you and I, if we publish something interesting enough and, um, and moving enough, I'm afraid I don't. My, my blog only gets 50 or 60 hits a day, but um, um, if, uh, if I published something that was really, really significant, then I can take on those magnets and get my message spread around the world very quickly. Thanks very much for the speech. Um, obviously, most of us would agree that journalism is a broad church, but I think hopefully most of us would also agree that, in the words of Kabira Haas, the, the Australian journalist, that our central job, job as journalists is, as she says, to monitor power and to power. Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously, that's a job that requires a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of expertise. I'm talking about serious public interest investigative journalism. Clearly, the mainstream media is not really up to the task in many ways at the moment. Is it something that you think social media is up to the task of doing, or do we need a, another model? We clearly need new models uh, to sponsor investigative journalism, which questions the misuse of power and, and the um, and where trying to develop those models. I mean, we have um, the Guardian newspaper based around uh, not-for-profit um, 
uh, trust, you know, that, um, that is a, a, seems to be a workable model, although they seem to be losing a lot of money as well. We have uh, a pro-publica model in the US. Um, we've got all sorts of crowdsource uh, operations. We've, you know, one, one good thing about journalism, of course, is this, we've actually got some very good journalism, including that going on here uh, at this institution, which is publicly funded but independent and critical. So, uh, and you've got thousands of these throughout the world. The, the bigger question is where those journalism graduates go afterwards if there aren't the jobs in the mainstream media. So I don't have the answer to the new uh, profit model. I'm, I'm sure if I did, um, you know, I, I could retire to the Bahamas myself, uh, having sold it to the, uh, you know, those dangerous corporate interests. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I'm encouraged by some of these more collaborative efforts. I think to get those endowments and the public sponsorship and the, uh, you know, the independent trusts. The broader public needs a better appreciation of uh, free expression uh, as a human right. And I'm not sure, I think we've been resting on our laurels, I'm not sure that's happened. And it's really up to us, um, the people who are interested, to come along tonight to go out there and uh, talk about uh, the importance of free expression and barbecues and uh, in, in, in their own communications. Mark, you haven't commented on public service broadcasting in any shape or form yet. Is that dead, is it, for you as a, a model that we should sustain and retain and enhance and invest in? Uh, the question is that I, I haven't commented on public service broadcasting and whether I think that's dead as a model. Um, and my answer is um, no, I, I don't think it's dead. I think there's just uh, enormously good work that's done within the independent public broadcasting that, that happens through government funding um, in the UK, Australia and New Zealand and some of the best investigative work uh, exposing some of the worst corruption in those countries and you know worst wrongdoing has come via that medium. Um, it is also unfortunately in some Pacific Island and other countries public broadcasting has a different meaning and that is a, a voice of the government uh, and it's actually a um, a, a propaganda tool in, in some other countries. In fact, people come from some of those countries and, and from China and just can't quite get their head around the ABC or the BBC and uh, these sorts of models. You know, you're telling me a government funds criticism of it? You know, how, do, how does this happen? But um, it's a wonderful thing we need to cherish while we have it. But unfortunately, the world is not in that great an economic state, and I can't see bucket loads of money being poured into the public broadcasters. I think their history in recent decades has been a continual history of cutback. And it may be an exception here, but I don't think so. And therefore, we need to look to these other models to, uh, to step up and, and, um, and provide other investigative reporting. Camille, are we, how are we going? Ah, right. Amar, uh, thank you very much for your address. You, know, we, you talked about um, freedom of the press and usually we're looking at less democratic countries. But I want to bring it back to the so-called democratic countries and I wonder about the wisdom and the fairness of advocating for press freedom for very, already very powerful institutions such as the media that then turns around and tries to constrain the freedoms of those who have a different opinion to them and who also are out there promoting a very conservative agenda or an agenda that suits their particular perspective. Why would we want freedom for that? Mm. And Camille has a, a very good question. Why would we want freedom of the press in Western democracies when so often that is giving freedom to a voice that marginalises and disempowers others uh, and, and promotes the corporate vested interests of the media companies that, that get that freedom. Oh, yep. mm -hmm. and, uh, and my answer is probably um, Winston Churchill's comment that it's really the best worst system uh, in that uh, as soon as we take a step to take that away from those powerful interests, how do we distinguish just distinguish them from those who are, might be smaller organisations, um, perhaps the independents, the, the ones that are under these other funding models. You can't have a free Guardian newspaper but not a free London Sun, I'm afraid. <clears throat>
Oh, Richard. I just wanted to pick up on what Camille said. I'm Richard Thomas, to for those of you who don't know me. And I was Radio New Zealand Specific Issues correspondent. When it comes to the mainstream, I'm picking up on Philip's comment. He talked about it, and Wayne said also that it might be the right way. But in my work as a journalist, particularly in the Pacific, particularly in Tonga, and I acknowledge the Tongans here in the audience, Wilkula here, and Hola Samani. Before I started reporting on Tonga, my entire context for it was shaped by Mike Field, who arguably is a powerful player in journalism, and other documents that I had read. And so the rhetoric that sat around Tonga, political freedom, the monarchy was, they don't want this, etc., etc. And the major voice that plays against the traditional so-called voice is Akalisi Pohiva. I'm pondering whether or not the mainstream media perhaps needs to go back and do a little investigation of its own so-called voice of authority. Because actually, the mainstream press got a lot of that wrong. And I recall being in Tonga after the riot, not the riots, again, the mainstream media planning riots, where the representative of the New Zealand government said, Helen Clark says we cannot have a semi feudal monarchy in the Pacific. But actually no one was asking the traditional Tongans who recognise that they have a different democratic system. It's not just ours. So my question is how in the silence around the reporting of minorities, that notion of festivals and famine, and then that's it, there's a silence in between. How does the mainstream media critique itself? How does the citizen journalist critique him or herself so that the material we receive that allows us to shape and form our opinions is actually representative of other than the press freedom mainstream view, which I think is where Camille was going with her question. Those are the things that I ponder, and I guess the whiteness, the white privilege of press freedom in a dominant discourse kind of way. I know it's a, a big thing, but I just found some of that very difficult to listen to. Thank you, Richard. Um, <laughs> well, no, it's just you can look at the stuff, you look at those helicopter journalists who come in and they get it wrong. They mm. consistently mm. get it wrong. And you mm. go, but this is the Herald. This is, I worked at Radio New Zealand. The way it ranks content, it, it gets it wrong. So, Okay, so, so the, the mainstream, so I just... I'm, Richard, I'm not going to cut you off, but I hope to get in the gentleman that's had his hand oh, up sorry, every, just, every time I do gender equity. Okay, okay. okay um, Richard's question is, how does mainstream journalism critique itself? And my answer is um, not well enough, and only occasionally, and only through a few channels. And often that is the public broadcaster in our countries that uh, has programs that uh, offer a reasonable critique of the media. But again, with the with the onset of blogs and uh, very, you know, uh, um, it, it's open to um, independent media of all sorts coming sometimes from different cultural groups to offer a critique of mainstream journalism. I'm certainly not an apologist for that marginalisation, but I, I'd suggest, Richard, that also you were there as a representative of Radio New Zealand, um, and uh, that I think that says something in itself. You were there. You uh, were a, a journalist. You didn't have the, the baggage that the reporters you're naming uh, may have had. You had a deeper cultural understanding of the situation and you had the opportunity as a Radio New Zealand reporter to um, give a deeper understanding to your listeners about the situation at hand. So just the simple fact that you were there doing that work is, I think, a sign of optimism. There was a gentleman over here, as, as long as it's a real question. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I guess I'm wondering about this in the social media context, the rise of the prosumer. And given these platforms are uh, controlled for profit, um, and really picking up on a comment Judy made recently about the rise of unpaid labour, um, where do you see all that going? Hmm. Well, there's a lot there, Tony. It's, um, yeah, the. The rise of unpaid labour in, um, uh, you know, in, in contributed copy and so on. People writing blogs who used to get paid to do journalism for a living. Um, 
And I sometimes think of that myself as I'm writing a blog, is this better submitted as a piece of freelance work? But then I suppose the state is paying me as an academic and I'm doing that as part of my work. It's, um, I, I guess there are, there are models there that allow us to use new media and get sponsorship for it. I mean, a bright light there was a, a high school leaver who I interviewed for a cadetship scholarship at my last institution who was 17 and already had um, 70,000 hits per week on a fashion blog and she had 10 advertisers and sponsors uh, on that blog, you know, um, and she, was a, uh, she obviously had struck a nerve in teenage fashion commentary and, uh, and she's probably breaking all the rules and cutting and pasting things from other places uh, for all I know, but nevertheless she'd established a reasonable um, business model within a niche. I think a lot of it is within niches and also, like anything, having in a capitalist society, having a, a bit of a business mind as to where um, publishing opportunities might be sponsored. I'm very mindful, to use that word, that we've worked, Mark, extremely hard and I'm going to move rapidly as Camille now deals with the thank yous. So, Mark, okay. thank you. as, oh. as state leader... <laughs> And we'd also like to thank the excellent moderation from Judy McGregor, because I know of no one else who would get women the voice to, to, uh, to notice that women need to ask the questions. And she also asked some very pertinent questions. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Judy. Now we have Amir Lofa to present to Professor Pearson by King Chadwick. Right. Uh, on behalf of all the Freedom Warriors, the Press Freedom Warriors, the Tusi Tellers, the Truth Seekers, the Truth Tellers, journalists and aspiring journalists, I extend a warm thank you to you, Professor Pearson, and to Professor McGregor. Thank you very much. You can stay here with me or you can have a seat up here. <laughs> uh -huh. um, uh, before we um, welcome, um, we remove for the Puro Puro Aki, I'd just like to, to note that um, Professor P copies of Professor Pearson's address uh, on the table out there. Please pick one up before you go. Um, I'd also like to, to uh, let you know that the Pacific Island Media Association looking for members um, they, they usually have a membership fee, but today, just for you, uh, membership is by COHA. So please join their forms outside and we'll do the heels here to answer any questions you may have. Um, Professor Pearson's uh, address and the questions that you've asked remind me of, uh, remind me of Albert Camus' uh, statement that says, a free press can be good or bad, but most certainly without freedom, it cannot be anything but bad. Um, this brings us to the end of this. Is David, is there anything else you'd like me to do? No, this is it. Well, let us thank, first of all, and most importantly, thank you all very, very much for your presence here, your questions, and your contribution. What has been a very interesting conversation. Sorry, Camille, I just got another two. Right. Okay. Would you like? Two more presentations to make to Tim McBride. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, not too fast, Camille, and a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. 